2023 will be remembered as another black mark against Wall Street. The consensus at the start of the year that a U.S. recession was not only probable, but very likely, has proved to be worth less than the paper it was written on. Somehow, the U.S. economy has managed to avoid falling off the rails. Somehow, it even managed to chug along at 2% growth. Over the past month, big U.S. banks like Bank America and J.P. Morgan decided to throw in the towel on their recession calls. They're now calling for a soft landing. Will they be proof right this time? What is really going on with the global economy? What can bring on a U.S. and global recession in 2024? How likely is such a recession? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about the big story shaping our world tomorrow. Anyone who needs convincing that the global economy is slowing should take a look at the results of the August Global Purchasing Manager Surveys, the most important barometer of the shifting winds of the global economy conducted monthly by S&P Global. August was the third month in a row that the Composite Global Purchasing Managers Index, known as the PMI, slowed. More importantly, the global GDP growth implied by the index is now at the lowest level since February, when the global economy finally came out of the slump brought on by the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. The slowdown in August cannot be simply put down to depressed global manufacturing activity. The manufacturing component of the PMI is weak, but stable. Manufacturing has been weak for much of the past year, but it did not get any worse in August. The real driver of the slowdown in August was the service sector. August was the fourth month in a row that the global services PMI slowed. Indeed, the service sector barely grew in August. Post-lockdown, we saw a dramatic shift in global demand out of manufactured goods into services. The implication of the recent slowdown in services is that global aggregate demand is slowing. It is safe to assume that if the recent trend of stagnating manufacturing and slowing services continues, the global economy will be heading for hard times ahead. I'm now optimistic. But the global economy is not one economy. Some countries are doing better than others. Indeed, a lot better. Comparing the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index across countries, India stands out as a bright spot, followed by Indonesia, with Russia and Mexico not too far behind. What do these four countries have in common, you might ask? They all happen to be beneficiaries of trade diversion, by which I mean international trade is diverted from more efficient exporters towards a less efficient one. Surely, it is not a coincidence that India, Indonesia, and Mexico are all major destinations for friendshoring, moving production to friendly countries by American and European companies under pressure to diversify their supply chains away from China. The fact that the manufacturing PMI for all three are all higher than that of China reinforces this hypothesis. But what about Russia? What does Russia have in common with the other three? I predicted more than a year ago that Russian manufacturing will get a big boost from import substitution. My argument was that whatever Russia could not import due to sanctions, Russia will have to figure out how to produce in Russia. The strong recovery of the Russian manufacturing PMI since the war suggests that the Russian manufacturing has indeed risen to the challenge. Perhaps counterintuitively, but in a way, U.S. sanctions are probably the best thing that's ever happened to Russian manufacturers. Thank you, America. At the other end of the spectrum of the August manufacturing PMI, we have U.S. allies in Europe. Indeed, the PMI is a reminder that Germany, the third largest exporter in the world, is the sick man in global manufacturing right now. August was the 14th month in a row that German manufacturing PMI was in contractionary territory. As I argue in a recent video, the main culprit is the proxy war the US and Russia are waging in Ukraine that has reduced the competitiveness of German manufacturing by increasing the relative cost of energy facing German companies. This, together with growing regulatory burden imposed by misguided climate policies, 
is forcing German companies to move their manufacturing base out of Germany and Europe in order to protect their market shares at home and abroad. In second place after Germany comes the UK. Unlike Germany, the manufacturing sector in the UK is relatively small. Indeed, a major stated objective of the pro-Brexit campaign was the revival of British manufacturing. Yet, as we approach three years after Brexit, British manufacturing is, on the contrary, shrinking even more. There can be no greater irony. Despite the weakness of the British pound that should have made British exports more attractive, British manufacturing has been in contractionary territory for now 13 consecutive months. The problem is that any pickup in British trade with non-EU countries has not been enough to offset the decline in trade with EU countries. The jewel in the Brexit crown was supposed to be a free trade agreement with the United States. And despite the UK having been the strongest backer of US policy against Russia and China, the British government has so far gotten nowhere close to even first base for getting a deal with Biden. In other words, the special relationship with America has not counted one jot where it matters. Rounding off the bottom three of the August manufacturing PMI, we have Italy. Italian manufacturing PMI has been contractionary territory for now five months. Italy's decision to join China's Belt and Road Initiative in 2019 was predicated on the assumption that it would provide a boost to Italian manufacturing. Since Italy joined the BRI, its exports to China have increased from 14.5 billion euros to 18.5 billion euros. However, Chinese exports to Italy have grown even more, from 33.5 billion euros to 50.9 billion euros. So it is understandable why Italy has decided to pull out of the BRI. But competition from China and other developing countries is unlikely to go away for Italian manufacturers at home or in third markets. Unless, of course, the West decides to embark on a total trade war on China. Which, by the way, is not totally impossible. The decision by the European Union this week to launch an investigation into whether to impose punitive tariffs to protect European producers of electric vehicles against Chinese imports that the EU claims is benefiting from state subsidies has the potential to unleash a major trade war between the EU and China. global PMI does not have anything good to say about global growth, what does it have to say about global inflation? The global PMI selling price index, compiled by S&P Global, edged down in August, but barely so. Indeed, this index has pretty much flatlined over the past three months. This could be interpreted as suggesting that the moderation of inflation late last year and early this year has run its course. While selling prices for services are easing, they're still at a high level by historical standards. The August US PMI, the Consumer Price Index, data released this week is a case in point. Core services inflation excluding housing, which accounts for about 50% of core inflation, grew 0.4% versus the previous month. This was the fastest rate of growth in five months. But what really caught my eye is the fact that selling prices for global manufacturing goods which had been declining steadily for more than a year, rebounded sharply in August. One month is not enough data to draw any conclusion, but I believe we have yet to see the inflationary impact of trade diversion. Again, trade diversion is about diverting trade from more efficient producers to less efficient ones. Moving production from China to India means higher costs of production and higher prices. Moreover, inflation in India is running at 7% versus 0% in China. The inflationary effect of trade diversion has been masked by the slump in global demand for manufactured goods over the past year. However, as excess inventories are brought down, I suspect we will start to see the inflationary effect raising its ugly head. In short, halfway through the third quarter, the world economy is not looking great. However, there's still a big difference between not looking great and a recession. So what would bring on a recession? 
The market expects fiscal policy to be less stimulative in both the US and Europe in 2024. It also expects that the lag effect of monetary tightening will be felt more keenly, especially as companies and households will have to refinance maturing debt a higher borrowing cost. Tightened fiscal and monetary policies imply a further slowdown, but they do not imply a recession or else being equal. History tells us that to get a recession, we need a shock. The shock that brought on the 2020 recession was the lockdowns. The shock that precipitated the 2008 recession was the collapse of Lehman Brothers. The shock that caused the 2000 recession was the bursting of the dot-com bubble. The shock that caused the 1990-91 recession was the spike in oil price as the result of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. These examples demonstrate that for a recession to occur, we need high oil prices or a sharp drop in asset prices or both. Let us examine the situation today in regards, first of all, to oil. In the U.S., oil inventories are falling, despite U.S. oil production being at a, a three-year high. U.S. commercial crude oil inventories fell to 4 million barrels below the prior 10-year seasonal average by the start of September, down from a surplus of 25 million barrels in mid-July. With Saudi Arabia and Russia extending their production cuts until the end of the year, there is not much buffer in the system in the event of a sudden shock. Such a shock can come in the form of an escalation of the Ukraine war that seriously disrupts Russian oil exports or a military conflict between Israel and Iran. I argue in a recent video that an escalation in Ukraine is inevitable before the winter sets in. But what about an Iran-Israel conflict? Frankly speaking, I don't know. All I know is that last week the Israeli Defense Minister and the Mossad chief separately accused Iran of building an airport in southern Lebanon that's 12 miles from the Israeli border to launch attacks against Israel and attempting 27 attacks over the past year on Israeli and Jewish targets around the world. As for asset prices, could there be a big correction in asset prices that could bring on the next recession? By definition, markets most vulnerable to a correction are the most overvalued markets. The U.S. stock market is the most overvalued market in the world right now. Indeed, the U.S. stock market has not been more overvalued since the end of the dot-com bubble. Investors are in love with U.S. stocks, especially with the so-called Magnificent Seven. The fact that interest rates are up and profits are down this year has not managed to take the shine off the U.S. stock market. So what would it take for the U.S. stock market to drop 20% and then bring on a recession? An intensification of the U.S.-China tech war could do the trick. After Huawei launched its new 5G phone two weeks ago, China has imposed a ban on the use of iPhones by Chinese government officials. Washington is now under pressure to respond with more sanctions against China. The problem is that such sanctions are likely to hurt U.S. companies doing business in China as much as they will hurt China. I also suspect the markets become too complacent about the cyclicality of the revenue streams of America's big techs. As the economy slows, so will corporate spending, whether it's tech spending or advertising spending. The revenue missed by Oracle last week that prompted a 10% decline in the stock price can be a harbinger of things to come. Google generated $224 billion in advertising revenue last year, and Facebook $113 billion. History says that in a slowdown, the first thing companies cut back on is their advertising budget. In my view, whether this received wisdom applies to America's big tech or not, will play a decisive part in determining whether the world economy will be able to avoid a recession in 2024. So history versus big tech. If you ask me, my money is on history. In summary, I was not in the recession camp coming into 2023. However, I am firmly in the recession camp for 2024. My prediction is that the economic cost of the U.S.-China proxy war in Ukraine and the U.S.-China tech war will further increase in 2024. 
I would also put my money on the growing global north-south divide, making an energy price shock more likely. I also think that America's big tech, notwithstanding their monopolistic power, will not be able to decouple from the global business cycle. And I haven't even begun to take into account of the 2024 US elections. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.